thank you very much. And uh, it's very interesting that I've been asked to talk about this because they gave me free reign. <laughs> Big mistake, <laughs> huge mistake. But bear with me as I talk about my interpretation, my quirky take on the radio industry in Zambia. Um, radio in Zambia is, of course, a growing industry, like many things. And uh, I will quote the person who gave me my first interview when I walked into Hot FM, a story which I will backtrack to in just a few minutes because I, I don't have a lot of minutes. But um, if I could sum it up, if you're doing anything in media in Zambia right now, and if you're doing anything that is going to actually make a difference, then you must actually consider yourself a pioneer. That's what I was told. And it's a bit of a scary task. It feels like a burden, like, wow, a pioneer, a maverick. You think this is the Steve Jobs of this world, the Bill Gates. But the truth is, that's why I chose radio in Zambia. It's because media right now is still evolving. Media everywhere is evolving. But in Zambia in particular, we have the advantage of technology. I mean, that's why we're here today. That's why Bongo Hive can exist. It's about technology. It's about pushing technology. And when it comes to radio, that is no exception. When it comes to media, that is no exception. But the interesting thing is, we also have no excuse right now. Because technology gives us exposure. So we can actually go out and we can easily see what the standards are. And for an audience, it means you guys can listen to anything else you guys want to hear. So if I sound horrible in the morning, you guys can easily tune into a show in Kenya, a show in Dubai. We won't even talk about your MP3 playlist, which has all your favorite tracks. So in that regard, it was a bit of a challenge. To backtrack, with regards to my background, um, I did not study mass communications. I did not study journalism. How I found myself here is a very interesting journey, I think. I always had a passion for broadcasting. I always had a passion when it came to actually talking to an audience, when it came to just media in general. I mean, we've, I think we've all thought about it to some extent, where we see an advert and we're like, oh, I could do that. You know, I think that advert concept is pretty cool. Or what if they did that? And the reason for that is because this industry appeals to the emotion. And you cannot divorce yourself simply because you are a client of what we produce or you are a consumer of what we produce. If anything, everything we put out in radio, in media, must get you emotionally involved. Even if you don't like what I'm saying. Even if it's facts like Manchester United absolutely suck. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> Point I'm getting at is, even if you don't like what I'm saying, it should generate an emotion. And for me, that was that connection with people. I always used to tell myself, I can never be in an industry, a, a people-driven industry, because I'm not a people person. Slap in the face. I'm in probably the industry that requires the most interactive forms of communication that we have right now. And I did talk about the fact that technology also aids that. So what did I study? I studied law. Very exciting. Yeah, you'd want me as a lawyer, right? You'd trust me as a lawyer? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? Wow, OK. Yeah, fine. <laughs> I studied law, um, Witts University, Johannesburg. Um, came back in 2007 to a legal and finance job. Very exciting. So not only do you not trust me to represent you, but I'm sure a lot of you don't trust me handling your money. I was doing both, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Harsh reality, but. That's how life plays out. So I was doing that and uh, met up with somebody, um, Kalumba, K-Smash, and uh, met up with another friend who I was in South Africa with. And he said, you know, this guy used to have a decent show on campus. And I said, yeah, I wouldn't mind something in the evening. Give me something in the evening. Walked in there, I believe it was a Tuesday during my lunch break. Walked in there, did my audition. Walked out at about 13.30. By 16, I got a call from the owner of Hot FM. Oh, by the way, I went to QFM first. And I was told no one was there to audition me. But 
No, I think they were hiding. I think they're like, oh God, <laughs> lunch breaks always save the day. But um, I, I did go to QFM first, so I, I, I don't know if history would have been any different. But uh, I went to, to Heart of them. Uh, they were kind enough to give me an addition. By 16 that same day, they called me up, sitting there in the owner's office, and he goes, I think we like what you have to offer. We're going to give you a try on breakfast. And I said, whoa, hey, 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 <laughs> time out. All right. For starters, I want to be on radio because I'm a fan of radio. So I've got a little knowledge. And if you're saying a breakfast show, that's a very tall ask for like a rookie, basically. I mean, I had done radio, but I didn't know the Zambian market, which reminds me of a story when I was in a lift with JK and I was like, so what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Kid you not. Kid you not. First week on radio, he was like this pompous git. I was like, no, really, what do you, what do you are you lost? You need direction. But um, yeah, so clueless, wet behind the ears, and I'm like, breakfast, really? Okay, this guy clearly has no clue what he's doing. So now I'm trying to explain the industry to him. No, you see, sir, with all due respect, you can. He says, yeah, I know that, breakfast. I said, fine. Didn't start immediately at the helm. Um, joined some other colleagues of mine who were still at the station. Uh, well, some who are still at the station. Some others have moved on to do other things. And for about three months, I was just learning the ropes, trying to figure out the industry. And about the fourth month, he called me in and said, what do you really need to do what you want to do? So I said, OK, well, I wouldn't mind a co-host, a female co-host. If I'm going to wake up in the morning, you know, um, I wouldn't mind doing something that involves news. <laughs> I wouldn't mind doing something that involves news. And he said, news, okay, well, you know, youth urban station, see how you can spin it. <laughs> so I went back, and to this day I've still got that notebook. And I thought, well, since I've been back, and since I've known ourselves as Zambians, what do we love talking about? How can I connect with the audience? And what can we actually be passionate about together, thinking on an interactive level. And of course, it's politics. Because if you sit at the bar, you're going to hear somebody give some theory on what the president should have done, how he should have done it, who's next in line, all that stuff. You're going to hear politics. We love politics in Zambia. It's politics, it's soccer. Soccer, the politics of soccer. Soccer in politics. It's, it's, it's politics, you know. And I just decided, well, I think Zambia needs just a bit of satire. Admittedly, having seen what is going on in South Africa and the levels at which they take their satire, <laughs> I knew you couldn't exactly implement that immediately. And I also accepted the challenge that it's not just the powers that be. It's not just the people you're sort of trying to get a point across to but, or about, but also the people you're trying to get a point across to. And I'll tell you right now, the first year of the Red Hot Breakfast Show, that was the day I wrote down the Kawalala Party, came up with. It's actually an acronym, which I've totally forgotten what it stands for. Like, keep, <laughs> keep Africa something, something, something. But like, I've totally forgotten what it stands for, which shows you how serious I am about my craft. <laughs> but um, I wrote that down, and I said, let's try this out. And uh, Premier did on that Monday, said, OK, um, this will actually provide a platform for me to report uh, objectively. Because when you report on a story, whether you like it or not, people are going to actually affiliate you with a certain site, whether you're the Post newspaper, whether you're ZNBC. People will automatically be like, oh, that's why he's talking about that. Because, and, uh, and those are the bar conversations we all hear and theories. So I decided, OK, let me create a platform that's neutral. That was a lesson that I had learned from journalism itself, the core of journalism, which is while you want to get yourself involved because you're on radio and emotionally attached to the audience, you also want to be a credible source. And how are you a credible source? Well, you basically just don't pick sides. You just basically don't pick sides. And the best way to do that is also to internalize it. I decided, let me make fun of myself, even before I make fun of other people. Let me call myself the Kawalala Party president, Africa's most honest party. Because if you vote for Kawala, you know what time it is, right? <laughs> you know exactly what you're getting. So I said, look, let's, let's interact on that level. First year was hard. The people I was talking to were harder than the people I was talking about. It's great to have to deal with the politicians being the angry ones about. 
what I'm doing. I'll, I'll tell you that. Because the first year was harder because you were trying to start something new in media. And there I was told, hey, do something new. You're going to be a pioneer. And what do you think? Oh, the world's going to embrace it. Not necessarily. The first year, it was actually my audience saying, you can't say things like that. This is not South Africa. You shouldn't give an opinion. The world's best presenters have an opinion. Larry King had an opinion. Clarkson has an opinion. Frost, Parkinson, they all have opinions. So it was a bit of an educational process, which is something I didn't realize when they said pioneer. You're like, pioneer, yeah, I'm going to be the first to do this. But you also have to then educate people about what you're doing. And for anybody thinking of getting into radio, whether you're going to take the political route, whether you're going to take the entertainment route, I would encourage you to go out there and try to do something new. But from the lessons I've learned, when you do something new, it's not going to work out immediately the first time. You do have to push. You do have to even educate the market about certain things. Technology is the same. I'm sure they can have their stories and their testimonies about how you're trying to introduce technology to people. And you're like, ugh. I remember my dad, the first time cell phones came out, he was given a cell phone by the company he was working for. And they were like, oh, you have to have this. And he, he didn't use it for like a year. He was like, I don't want this, you know? And I was like, but it's a cell phone. And he goes, yeah, but, and literally he said this, I kid you not. He goes, but gee, when I'm taking a crap, someone can call me, you know? That was his main concern. He was like, hey, 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 this is, even when I'm doing my most private business, somebody can call me. And I said, oh, valid point, actually, valid point. <laughs> but the fact is, anything we introduce that's new, there's gonna be a bit of resistance. But media is not exempt from that either. So moving on, innovation, when we talk about it, we often think that innovation is for our marketing people, our creative people, our advertising agencies. But even if you're not in media, one thing that I hope I have pushed through the very little time I've had on, 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 in media is that even what may seem bland or banal can actually be repackaged. So even if you're a banker, be innovative about what you do. If you're a courier, be innovative about what you do. And for me, as I've said, I love this industry because the innovation shows immediately, all right? If you did not think of something on the spot, you've had a crap show. If you're not innovative, the next guy is switching over to something else. I mean, I would encourage you to actually talk to Chiru, by the way, who's a great inspiration to all of us, right? Um, about the transition of technology, because I remember the lecture that he actually gave, the talk that you actually gave at the radio summit, the soccer radio summit. And he talked about where radio is heading and where it's going and how basically with technology we have so many alternatives. So we do have a lot of alternatives. And even when you pursue a career in radio, what purpose are you there for? And don't be shy about your purpose. If you want to make people laugh, go and make people laugh. But be the best at it. If you want to go the business route, study up on your stuff. There's resource after resource, reference after reference. Go check on Reuters, go check on whatever. Find out what it takes. Admittedly, I started off by talking about my background because what I have learned is through technology because I have managed to sit down, I've managed to ask people questions, I've managed to check up online and find out, even something as simple as editing. So at the end of the day, Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to being pioneers in this industry, there's more than enough room for everybody. And I do encourage people to look at radio not just as another paycheck or a way to actually be recognized when you actually go and you don't have to pay for your beers. <laughs> no, but seriously, it's, it's, it's more than that. At the end of the day, definitely be yourself. For me to walk across the road, because the bank I was in was right across the road from QFM, from Hot FM, when I decided, let me go and audition, right? So for me to get up and walk across the road and risk an industry that admittedly was not even paying as much at the time and things like that, but I realized that there's room for growth and the room for innovation and, and, and scope of that. The reason that I got up is because I said, if I'm crossing the road right now and I get hit by a bus, I'm going to be replaced, what, maybe two days 
The first day will be to clear out my desk. The second day will be to call the next kid from Ziale to come and replace me. <laughs> and business will go on. It'll go on. My colleagues will miss me, but business will go on. And if I'm on radio, whether I suck or not, <laughs> if I get hit by that bus, guess what? I've left a gap. I've left a footprint. I've left a bit of a legacy. So it's also a huge, huge, huge ask once again when you're in something that is pioneering because you are yourself at the end of the day to be yourself and to have a purpose for what you do. So for me, that is basically what I have to say. Anyway, yeah, so I'm Lee and I work at Rock FM. Um, right, where should I start with my story? Okay, I don't know how I got into radio because it really was an accident, but a happy one at that. Um, I originally studied acting and uh, film at a film school in Cape Town. It's called AFTA. So that's what I was doing. And I worked in South Africa for a number of like, years doing like acting on different TV series and fell into behind the scenes stuff, which was more production based. So I've like produced documentaries for different NGOs. Like I've worked with the UN, um, an NGO called Fanapan. I worked with SABC2 on a TV show called Living Land, which is an agricultural show. So yeah, my background in media is more sort of film and very visual based, not so much, you know, radio. And I moved back to Zambia about three years ago. Yeah, yeah it's been three years since I moved back. And I came back and I was kind of working behind the scenes again, like doing producing stuff and working with like Amaka Arts Festival, trying to find out what was happening in Zambia because all I heard from my friends was like, oh, you're creative, come back home. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on. I should preface that with the fact that I'm Zimbabwean, but I, I was raised here, so I'm a Zim Zambian. <laughs> um, yeah. So I came back and my friends were like, there's a lot of stuff going on. Get involved in like something. Like, there's people like uh, Ground Zero and whoever else who are doing projects. Like, find a way to get in there and immerse yourself, and like help sort of get the creative industry here going. So I tried to do that, which I found kind of tricky because you know not so many people. They're all like, "Who are you? What have you done? Show us your work." And you're like, "Uh." So anyway, uh, me working on radio, it started last year, only in September. So I'm only like 10 months into radio. I'm the baby. So yeah, I went for an audition at Rock FM. I don't know who told me to go or how I found out about it to this day. I think it was something like on Facebook. I don't know, I saw it on Facebook or something. But I was already, f I knew Lulu, who was working there at the time. Um, so I was like, ah, oh, why not go? And the audition was for a newsreader. So I have no background in journalism, none of that stuff. Not great at public speaking, as we can see, you know. But um, I said, OK, why not go and you know, try this thing called radio and news reading? Why not? Because at, at that time, I was freelancing. Like I write for several different publications, like magazines and stuff. So I went in, and I was like in a line of like 10 people, whatever. They call me in. They like read this sports story. And it was like a cricket story. And I'm sitting there going, what? I don't even watch cricket. What? And if anyone, I don't know, you guys who are in the room and love cricket, like, why is it like Russian? What's happening there? Because like, I'm busy trying to read this cricket story. And I'm like, I don't know how to read these scores and like the terminology. So uh, yeah, basically, I bombed my audition at Rock. Went home, and I was like, eh, didn't get that. But having been an actress in the past, I'm used to like going home and being like, that sucked, they're not gonna call me back. So what happened this time was, I was just chilling at home and I was like, ah, oh, on to the next thing, gotta find a job somewhere else. And uh, I think it was like on the Tuesday or something, Mitch called me up and he was like, hey, we heard something in your voice, we really like you, so come back. But he did also mention that I sucked. <laughs> let's, let's not forget that, he did say that, which, which is fair enough. So yeah, I went back and they were like, we'll train you. So I was busy training to be a newsreader and um, trying to sort of watch everything that I could online or even um, like watching TV news, which is kind of not the way to go necessarily if you want to be doing news on radio because no one can see you. So then I started listening more to like different uh, BBC radio and all those kinds of 
uh, radio shows and ones in SA to just hear how other people are presenting their news. And it was tricky at first. A lot of people hated my presentation style. But whatever, some people liked it. Um, so after like about, I think it was three days of like sort of training, they just threw me to the wolves and were like, go inside, Yoko and KB are doing RTC right now, go read the news. And I was like, what, huh, live, what, huh? Not pre-recorded, right now. So I went in, did it. I thought I sucked, but I didn't do, I didn't do that badly. And then for just like, you're still training, like come in early and practice, but we're gonna throw you in every time it's Yoko and KB doing RTC. Go in and read the news. So I started doing that. Then um, there was a gap in Thrill's house, which is the breakfast show on uh, Rock FM. So they were looking for a girl to like help co-host and do the news. So they're like, Lee, why don't you come join us? It's at 6 a.m. And like the boss was like, can you wake up and be there at 6 a.m.? And I was like, that's not a problem for me. Very easily done. So I joined that crew. And at the time, it was me, and it was Thrillmatic and Muya. So I started doing that show and reading the news. So I sort of, it came from like sitting in the room with all these people and watching them do their shows is how I sort of said, oh, I have opinions. I have things that I want to share with the public. Like, why don't I speak up? So that's how I ended up on Thrill's House. So I did that. And, and then um, they asked me to keep continue reading news on RTC, which was the show that came after Thrill's House, so 9 till 12. So I was there for like six hours a day, doing two back-to-back -back radio shows, which was kind of crazy, because then I started being involved in both in a bigger capacity and like co-hosting or being the third chair. And that was like kind of taking a toll on my personal life, because I go home and I had nothing to say to anyone in my life. I was just like, screw all of you. I have nothing to say. I've spoken for six hours today. So yeah, um, that's what happened with that. And I just got a lot of my training on radio was sort of being mentored by people like Yoko, who would like give me tips, or like Lulu, I'd had to help her co-host when LBC was sick one day, or I had to help LBC co-host when Lulu was sick one day. So I kind of got the best of the sort of radio education in the sense that I think, in fact, out of all of the Rock FM DJs, I think I'm the only one who's like done a show with like practically everybody. There might be one person I've never done a show with but I'm like the kid who's sort of filled in for everybody and learned, which taught me a lot. Cause like when you're coming into things, working with people who I didn't know, you don't know if your personalities are gonna get along, if on air you're gonna gel, but I found a way to like adapt. So, you know, I, I could work with Thrill, I could work with LBC, I could work with Lulu, I could work with Psycho Tash. So yeah, that was really great experience for me. And then um, I can't remember when Yoko left. But Yoko left us, which was a sad day. But it also opened up a, a, an opportunity for me because I got to be KB's. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. I mean, it did, though. I mean, because now I was like, she's gone. Let me take over. It's my turn. So yeah, I sat in her chair and uh, took over as KB's co-host for RTC. And then um, about in December of last year, because it was getting too taxing doing two different radio shows and my voice was like there for six hours. They needed a different dynamic, I think, for breakfast show. And let's face it, I was getting tired of waking up that early. <laughs> so I basically, as of January of this year, I'm only on Rock the City. So that's nine till 12 weekdays, Monday to Friday, plug in, tune in if you can. That's 96.5. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of my little radio story. I don't know what else to say. Challenges in the industry. I guess the weirdest is not really a challenge for me. I think everyone can kind of relate. People think we're all competing with each other. Or like we all hate each other. Like people think, oh, I hate. People actually think we, within in-house that like the chicks don't like each other or that there's beef. And I'm like, no, we're actually the most supportive group. Check Sandy, she's there supporting me. Like, we all like each other and enjoy each other. And I think all of our stations, like everyone who's here to talk from wherever you've worked, all of the stations are very different. And all of our content is very different. All of our individual shows are very different. So it's not really about trying to be better than the next person or whatever. Like I always say, don't try and be better than the next person. Be better than how you were yesterday or what you did yesterday. 
Like, one-up yourself. Don't try and one-up somebody else. So, um, yeah. And in terms of entrepreneurship and stuff, uh, currently working on starting my own production company and working on a docu-series that's still in the works. But yeah, that's me, going sort of more back into film. But I'm enjoying and loving radio. All right. Um, it's, I'm going to start with something that Chi said. Chi spoke about the fact that he first auditioned at QFM. I have a similar story. <laughs> my first audition on radio was on QFM. I had just finished school, uh, fresh out of school, and I thought, you know what, I'm not doing anything. I love music, which is maybe that's where I should start from. I love music. That's the first thing about me. I love music. And I got into radio for music. I always used to listen to the radio, and I always used to think, there's something missing about Zambian radio, and, and that's the music. We keep playing the same crap. <laughs> and, and I hated that about Zambian radio. And I thought, you know what? I want to go onto radio, and I want to play songs and music that I think people should listen to. And so I thought, there was a new station open, QFM. I thought, you know what? Let me go and audition. I went for the audition. Uh, they asked me to sit in the chair. I sat in the chair. Never done an audition before. Fresh out of school. And they said, talk. <laughs> See, now, if you've ever done an audition before, that's the scariest thing. To do. Just talk. You don't know what to talk about. And so, you know, cut a short story short, I bombed that audition. But I walked away having learned something about that audition. And I walked away thinking, I may never do radio again, but if I ever do, I want to be able to go and change radio from a music point of view and anything else that I can do. So three, a couple of years later, uh, sitting at home, a cousin of mine came home, uh, Mark BC. I don't know how many people know Mark BC. But Mark BC came. He used to play on Radio Phoenix a long time ago with Chilo, actually. That's how old Chilo is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so Mark, Mark, is, Mark is my first cousin. And Mark came home, uh, had just come, come from England. He came home and was listening to music. He was listening to my collection. And he said, you know what? You've got, like, you've got music that I don't even get to hear in the UK. Have you ever thought about doing radio? So I told him the story. I said, yeah, actually, I have. But I gave up on that. Now I'm in school, and I much prefer doing school than doing radio. And that was the end of that. Um, a month later, he calls me. Again, he's just come from England. He calls me, and he says, dude, I'm stuck in town. I don't know how to get home. Can you come and pick me up? I'm like, yeah, sure, man, no problem. You're my brother. I'm coming for you. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I go to Findico House, which is where he says he is. He says I'm on the 22nd floor. Again, I'm clueless about where I'm going. I get to the 22nd floor, and I find a radio station, Choice FM. And he says, actually, you know, it's good you're here. This is Tivo. Tivo, meet me. Talk. And he takes a step back. And so Tivo starts asking me questions. And he says, you know what? Why don't you come in tomorrow? Just come in. I think you've got a great personality, a great voice for radio. Come in. And so I thought, what do I have to lose? So I went in the following day. I went in and I sat in a room much like this, but slightly smaller. It was the size of was probably from here to there. There was me, there was KB, um, Glinks, and some other guys. And we sat in a room for like two weeks. And all we did in these two weeks was listen to radio. He had this digital satellite radio, which he made us listen to for two weeks nonstop. As we would just get in there in the morning, sit down, and do nothing. We just sit there. And at some point, I thought, what the hell is up with this guy? <laughs> like, I thought I came in here to try out radio, but here I am sitting down listening to radio. So for whole, two whole weeks, that's all we did. And then he says, all right, guys, I think you guys are ready for radio. I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, we haven't done anything. He says, no, I think you're ready. So he gave us all like midnight slots. Now, here's the challenge of radio. Back in the day, Back in the day, it was all about dedication. I don't know about now, but back in the day, it was all about dedication. So he says to us, he says, listen, the six of you, I'm going to split you up throughout the week. So you take one night, you take another night, you take another night. But here's the catch. We can't take you home. So you have to decide now. Do you want to do radio? Because if you do, you have to stay the whole night. And so I thought, OK, yeah. So for, for whole one month, I would spend the entire day, spend the night at Choice of him do a one, two-hour slot, and wait until morning, get on a bus, head back home for three weeks. The first show I did was rubbish. The second show I did was rubbish. The third show I did was rubbish. But when I got to the fourth show, and this is something that I tell people who, start, who go into radio nowadays, is 
When you get to a point where everything just starts making sense, when the microphone becomes your friend, when the equipment becomes your friend, you know you've arrived. You know that I have reached the point where I have, there is no going back. If there's dead air, I know what to do. It's, I think it's called comfort, your comfort zone. And yes, thank you. And that's where I got to. I got to a point where it just all made sense. It's like I became one with the equipment. So nowadays, when I go on the radio nowadays, and something happens, I don't panic because of that. Because I have become part of the equipment. So anyway, that's, my, that's Choice FM. I left Choice FM. Uh, stuff happened, left Choice FM, and did nothing for a while. And then Gesh came, to, came up to me. He says, you know what? You should, you should think about joining us. I said, really? He says, yeah. So I, I ended up at, at, at Radio Phoenix. Uh, I had my first show, actually, was during the trade fair. So everyone, because you know, they still, we still do this. Everyone went to Ndola. The entire radio station went to Ndola to cover the, the trade fair. And I was the new kid, and they said to me, uh, your first slot is tonight, Friday night, Gesher's show. I'm like, shit, Gesh. And this is Gesh. I'm like, what, Gesh? So I did, I did his show, and it was fine. It wasn't rubbish. There's a phone call that never came, so I knew I had done well. Because there's a phone call that we get at the office. If it doesn't come, you're good. So I did that one show. I did a few more shows while the guys were away. When they all came back, they shut me out the door. They were like, OK, we'll give you a call if we need you. So I'm like, wait a minute. I did, was that used? Because I, like, I did like really good shows. Uh, they ended up calling me after a while. And I got, I got my first slot. And I've been on Phoenix since then. Um, and there's something that someone said to me the other day. They said, you know, radio, I think this is something that she mentioned and, and, and uh, Lee mentioned. Radio, radio, there is an honor about being on radio. And that honor is to be able to change people's lives, to be able to impact on someone's opinion on things, to be able to ask questions that you guys can't ask. That's our job on radio. Our job on radio is to ask what you can't ask. That's the job you've given us. And I, I sometimes I feel like it's a bit of a disservice if we don't do that for you. We, we are in the business to entertain, yes. We're in the business to inform you. And that information comes from us asking you the right questions, asking the questions that you guys want to hear. And so when, when I go on radio, I always go on radio saying, if this is my last show and I never get on radio again, I want to be able to have said, I asked the questions that people wanted to hear. And if I don't do that, then there's absolutely nothing I'm doing on radio. I may as well just sit home and chill because that's the joy of being on radio. It's about asking questions and asking the questions that you guys want to hear. That's, for me, that's what I think. Um, but also, my boss is here. He said to me, he says, I want you to do breakfast. I said to him, I said, hell no. And he'll, he'll confess. I said, no, there is no way I'm doing breakfast. Because that's what I do. My, the first thing that goes through my mind when I'm asked to do something is say, yeah, I don't think I can do it. So I said, no, I, I don't want to do breakfast. And, and, and the reason why as well was I, looked at, I, I always look at the players, and I think, yeah, I can't compete with this. You know, it's like, whoa. But he said to me, he says, I think you've got something, and I think we can tap into it. And I think, I think you'd be a good morning show person because of the things that you bring to the fore. So if you're planning on going to radio, here are a couple of tips. Your interests have to get on the radio. If your interests are business, as she said, if your interests are business, you need to bring the business to the radio. If your interests are reading and novels, you have to bring that to the radio. Because otherwise, who, what are you bringing to the radio if you're not bringing yourself? You need to constantly bring yourself. All the things that you go through in your daily life, you need to bring those onto the radio. Otherwise, it's pointless. And he said to me, he said, your person, your personality, the things you go through, are the things that everyone in this room goes through. You know, we all go through tax. We hate tax. We all go through that. We all go through crappy roads and portals and tire bursts. We all go through that. These are all things that you guys and my audience can relate to. And the minute you can connect with that, the minute you can connect with your audience on that level, then you have a great show. We did a prank. Uh, this is the last story. We did a prank, because I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> we did a prank on the radio 
which I didn't think was going to work for, for, that, for um, April Fool's Day, which was to get married on the radio. Now, because of the way that Zambians, and I hate this about Zambians. Edit that. I hate this about <laughs> Zambians because Zambians, we are so, we're so straight. Like, you can't, you take this line that says, this is how we treat certain things, i.e. marriage, culture, tradition, all of that. And if you venture and cross the line, you're labeled as, how could he? So we decided to take something, an institution like marriage, which is supposed to be this wonderful institution, and it is. And we decided to take this, this thing and say, let's pull a prank on people. I'm getting engaged. It worked as a proposal on radio. And people bought it. Like people, I had people calling me and saying, you know, I'm coming to bring you some money, donations, <laughs> wine bottles. And at some point, and I remember, I got a call from, from LBC, who's, who's a big, big, good friend of mine. And he said to me, he says, whatever you do, don't tell people it was a prank. But then after three days, I thought, you know what? I think I have to tell people it's a prank. Because I'm getting to a point where it's beginning to get scary. There's a guy who called me and says, I'll donate a million to your wedding. I'm like, whoa, OK. All right. I'm broke, but I don't need that money. So we decided that after three days, we said, you know what? It was a prank. Thank you very much. But after that, the most amazing thing happened. After that, everyone was like, how could you? Like, it's marriage. The institution of marriage is one that you don't mess around with. How could you? But that's what radio is. Radio is about crossing the line and being able to come back constantly. Um, like Luchi, I have trouble projecting. And following those three isn't the easiest thing to do because I thought, you know, I'm going to be like you know, fourth or whatever. So I'll just take down notes and say whatever they said. I didn't realize they were going to say everything I wanted to say. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Um, radio for me, like. Lee happened by accident. Uh, stuck with it because, like Chi, I wanted to pioneer something, you know? And unlike Luchi, I did not get turned down at Q. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I did have a love for music, and I did have this thing where I would listen to an album, and just like when Babyface came out, um, I think it was seven days, no, The Day, seven days? What was the album? The Day? Come on, guys. Yeah, The Day, <laughs> you know? And all you'd ever hear was that, travel around the seven seas, you know? Like, it was the one song they played constantly. And like, this album has like 10 other songs that no one ever gets to listen to. So that was my main drive. So um, I had just started doing Banana and it was picking up in the country and people were excited about it. And I went in for a show. Um, I think it was, it was a teen something, Next Wave. Yeah, it was called Next Wave. And they wanted to interview me and find out, you know, playing the HIV positive girl, what was I like? Not cool, I didn't like it at all. But it's another story for another day. Um, so I went there and um, I did this show. And they're like, oh, yeah, you did a really good job. I'm like, oh, thanks. OK, bye. No, no, no. We want you to come back next week. But I said everything I had to say. And they're like, oh, no. Um, we'd like for you to become a presenter, because we like the way. And I think it was Tracy at the time who was talking to me, which was kind of weird, because I'd been semi-stalking her brother, TiVo. <laughs> <laughs> He, he'd, he'd done this thing where, um, I think he was on radio, and I was listening, and he goes, I, OK, I just loved the way he presented. And he'd, he said, oh, if Brandy's voice was a woman, I would marry it, you know? And then I started writing him notes as Brandy's voice. Because <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's like you're there, and you're just like, so like, I meet him, and I'm just like, and I can see like a paper, you know, <laughs> just kind of like tossed to the side. I'm thinking, I should probably not mention that that's me. Eventually, they caught on because at some point they saw my handwriting. But yeah. Uh, so Tracy says, would like for you to stay, you know? And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Um, I'm going to talk to my mom about it. And she's like, uh, I think that's what I love about my mom. My mom's so unconventional, hence this. I don't think 
sane people could come up with this. You know, <laughs> it, it took a lot of crazy to, to put this together. But um, she was like, you know, as long as your grades don't fall, which they did, and um, you know, you can manage to balance the two, go ahead. And I remember my first show, like, as Yoko, the presenter, not the guest. And I'm just like, oh, I nailed it. I did so good. I go home, I'm like, mom, you don't see my show. She's like, yeah, I did. OK, how was it? It was good, right? And she's like, no, no, not really. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, I think my mom schooled me on radio. Like, that one conversation, she said, why do you talk so fast? Because for me, radio was like, hey, you're listening to Choice FM, and we're doing blah, 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 blah. you know? It was, it was about how quick you could talk and how many cool words you could say in the space of 10 seconds. And she said, next time you go on air, talk like you're talking to me. Because apparently she thought she was my buddy. So talk like you're talking to me. So that's what I did. I started talking like I was talking to my mom. And I found my voice. It kind of felt, I think at the time I was on radio, it was, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook. There was, you all could say nothing. The only thing you could do was switch stations, yeah? Like, or maybe call me and if I decide to pick up the phone, here, I'll answer and then you can tell me that I'm not doing a good job. But otherwise, psh, you had no control whatsoever, which I loved. Damn Twitter. But um, it's allowed me to envision actually speaking to someone. And that's what I took to, for me to radio to say, I am always talking to at least one person. And then it dawned on me, like, if I'm talking to one person, do I really just want to be randomly speaking about Kim Kardashian and how, you know, she's going to marry one black guy after another? Sorry, no, 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 she didn't marry all of them. <laughs> Sorry. Facts, yes? <laughs> Facts. Um, or do I want to impart something that's going to change somebody's life? You know, are they going to be able to do something with the knowledge that I have given them? I mean, of course, you're going to put in all your entertainment and everything. But at the end of the day, I wanted someone to be able to say, oh, I listened to Yoko. And um, she gave me a tip on how to lose weight, which I'm constantly doing and undoing. So you know, and someone could take that and use that. So that was for me, my turning point, once that started. It also made me realize that my listeners were intelligent, which is something I think a lot of Zambian DJs took for granted. You know, like, I remember when I said I was at <clears throat> Q at the time, where I didn't audition. They actually called me. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, and I said, I want to do a book review. Every week, I'm going to look at the New York Times bestsellers. And so I don't wear heels. So if you're wondering why I keep moving, it's balance. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they were like, um, you want to do a book review? And I'm like, yeah, I want to do a book review. I want to you know, just see whatever, what's going on out there. Like what books are selling, nonfiction, fiction, you know, that kind of thing. And because I thought I was like, you know, one of those, I read. No, no, I swear. The fact that I was reading Mills and Boom didn't <laughs> look at it. It was just like, I read. And, you know? So I start looking at this, and I started to do it. And I realized there were people who would actually call me and say, oh, I've actually read that book. You know? And you're like, oh, we've got readers out there. And, you know, and it allowed me to start to explore different avenues. So if someone came up to me today and said, uh, Yoko, what has been your contribution to radio? It would basically the recognition that we have a smart audience and that they need a lot more than just beat by beat and Kim Kardashian. There's a lot more to it, even though I have to say she's one of the smartest people I know. People who can make money from doing nothing are awesome, in my opinion. I mean, that is a talent I wish I had. Do nothing, make money. So yeah, it came from that. The next thing, so I'm pretty much what you'd call the industry crutch <laughs> when it comes to radio, because like a superhero, I go where I'm needed. I like to think. <laughs> uh, I, I started with Choice FM, moved to QFM, where I gained most of my radio experience. I think QFM was 
Um, I don't like to say it's to the Nyamas. I really should do it more often. But I think that's where I found Yoko, the radio personality. They really taught me a lot there. But I tend to like, you know, champion the cause of the underdogs. I moved to rock because it was new. You know, and it was like, oh, something new. You know, we can build. I love the construction aspect. But then I got tired of trying to be a king. Like throughout my, I've been in radio for like, sorry, my thoughts kind of scatter. I've been in radio for like 10 to 12 years. It's very little to show for it, but 10 to 12 years. And it's hard to stand out, okay? Especially as a, as a female. You'd always have that, oh, this is the first lady of the station, which I think is absolute nonsense. It's how they keep us down, you know, because now you're busy fighting each other to be first lady, you know, so that kind of thing. So I was always that kind of person who's on a show that's great, but never seen as being great. You know what I mean? And she did bruise my ego a bit. Not that it came down as much as it should have, but, you know. Um, but it made me realize that I don't want to be a king. I want to be a kingmaker when it comes to radio. I want to be the person who can start up a show, have it go great and everything, and then just walk out <laughs> <laughs> and have someone else carry it on. I want to be the person who sets up a platform for other people to be able to excel. So that is pretty much what I'm doing now. So QFM, I'll see you. I know, I know how many DJs you've lost to Chimwala FM. I should probably <laughs> scoot over. But yeah, that is what I want to bring to radio. I want to be able to create an industry in which people thrive. I, I, I feel like we hold on for a bit too long. And I think that's one thing I love about Chilo. You managed to evolve from stage, you know, you like from one, sta from one stage in radio to, a, you know, a lot of us would be like, I'm going to be the DJ. And you can't tell me nothing. I've been here for 10 years. I'm the best. I have my show. And you, you get what I mean? But you're not really growing. I think that's where the Zambian industry lacks, especially entertainment, be it radio, TV, and everything. You just have people who are not growing because they're too comfortable in whatever setup they're in. So as for me, in terms of way forward, aside from finally auditioning for QFM and getting a slot there now. Um, I would, I don't, we don't have syndicated shows in Zambia. I mean, Caristo Jr. is my hero currently. When I heard how he did a breakfast show on one radio station one day and then an afternoon show on another radio station the same day, I was just like, Oh, wow. <laughs> My 10 years, I never accomplished that. It was just like, wow, you know? So I, that's what I want to see. I want to see content that is so universal. Stations don't care where it aired first. You know what I mean? Um, we've grown from DJs just being the people who play the music and who talk to DJs being brands. And a brand should not be limited by where it's exposed. You know what I mean? It shouldn't be, oh, just because the brand started here, it can't go elsewhere. I mean, we need to reach a point where DJs, or should I say radio presenters, because half of us can't even mix, <coughs> me included. I can't for the life of me. Um, DJs create a brand for themselves that it doesn't matter which station they're at. It doesn't matter if you're play playing at midnight. People want to stay up and listen to you because you have you're a brand. You're, you're an entity, a force of nature. Now I'm just randomly putting up words, so I'll collect my thoughts. But yes, that's what I want. I want to be able to do a show that can air on every radio station without any of the station owners feeling threatened, but actually just seeing it as value added simply because the show is that good. So that's pretty much me. But. Um, yeah, aside from that, world domination, <laughs> pretty much. And I think, oh, I think that's an important thing to say, though. Why I do media, why I do entertainment, why I do acting, everything I do has always been to influence the agenda. I got tired of people telling me what I should think, 
or what I should say or how I should think. And I said, I want a platform where the information is so free that I can actually set my own opinion, not because someone has bombarded me with this type of information, but because I have all the facts, and now I can set my opinion. So that's pretty much it, agenda setting the right way. So it's good to see so many people, some familiar faces, some that we know from social media. Um, I've seen you noisemakers, you two guys over there. <laughs> I might walk out if you carry on. No, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. OK, so to start with, um, just want to an observation. If you are a radio presenter like you Unza FM guys and you want to be invited to this talk and you're a guy, if you have uh, the word chi somewhere in your name, <laughs> you stand a chi, it could be chi, lu chi, chi lu. I'm wondering why they didn't invite Man Chilu from Radio 4 <laughs> to come up here too. All right, so this is going to be good. I'm going to give you your money's worth. How much did you guys pay? <laughs> you see where I'm going. All right. The first thing I've done is to prepare you know, some of the things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, I've put them on this iPhone. So if I'm looking, I'm not checking text or anything of that sort. And I'll give you a short little story about preparation. When I was um, about maybe 23 years old, I was the station manager, acting station manager at Radio Phoenix. Uh, that's another story how that happened. But at the same time, I was a member of the church choir. And I decided that I'd be singing you know, at the front on Sunday, but I didn't have time to go for rehearsals. So on one Sunday in particular, you know, we were up at the front, you know, congregations there, we're singing some worship song in Bemba. And I was feeling this track, you know, it was just kind of, you know, hitting me there. So I close my eyes, you know, and I'm singing and I'm swaying with everybody. And at some point I opened my eyes and I could see the congregation, but I couldn't see the choir because they had knelt down. Because during rehearsal they had planned <laughs> that halfway during the song they're gonna kneel and you know start swaying. <laughs> so there I was, you know, dork, you know. Yeah. So so in terms of preparation, I always kind of feel I have to prepare so that you know I'm not the dog who's kind of standing up there. First of all, Big thank you to Bongo High for the invitation. I have to also acknowledge SWAMBO, She Who Must Be Obeyed. That's the acronym. <laughs> that's my wife, Carol. And then also this panel here has spoken extremely well. And I'm thinking back to when I started radio, which was 18 years ago. I'm showing my age now. Mrs. Pemba at Radio Phoenix said something to a client who was in the room. And she said, um, this is Chilu, he's very good, but I think he's ahead of his time, or something like that, which made me feel kind of you know, weird, like I'm the misfit. But then the guys who've been speaking today, I mean, I think this is the time that she was speaking of, because the, the level of intellect and passion and everything else, that's what we've witnessed here, and I think you guys should give them a big round of applause. OK, so about radio and me in radio, I started, um, you know, Long time ago. How old were you guys in 96? Just. Six. No, seriously. So you were six. Oh. <laughs> How old were you? At the... You're turning 20. So you were? Uh, help me out with the maths. <laughs> How old were you in 96? Wow. OK. I'm out. <laughs> no, cool. So. Essentially, I'm speaking to a group of people. Some of them, most of you guys probably didn't hear me when I was on radio, and that, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter much. Uh, but what I decided to do before coming here was to add value in some form or, 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 or other, which, which will be value to do with life, value to do with radio, and, you know, tell you some stories that might inspire you. So the first one that I want to just kind of share is when I started out at Radio Phoenix, it was Right at the beginning, there was no one at the station apart from three people. Carol, funnily enough, my wife being one of them. There was Moses Nyama, and there was a guy called Jack Amuza who's since passed away. And I was at the station for about a day, and then there's a guy called Zach Chavula. I don't know who knows Zach, man with the master plan? Yeah. So Zach and I were seated in the reception area waiting for our break. And while we were waiting, um, the station manager at the time, Jack Amuza, told us that there were a lot of LPs that needed to be sorted out. So they bought a heap of records, and you know, Zach and I sat in a room sorting them out while waiting for, for this break. 
And while, while that was happening, there was a bunch of people in the reception area who were, there, I mean, every day, this, this went on for maybe, I don't know, two weeks, uh, like, you know, Luchi's story. And guys started complaining. Zach and I were busy just sorting LPs, talking about music, talking about our mutual friend, Daddy Zamas, you know, having those kind of conversations. And then Errol Hickey came into the studio. And back then, you know, Errol Hickey, it was the 19th floor of Society House before it burned down. And sometimes when the lifts weren't working, you know, stairs uh, for shifts. But Errol Hickey, when he'd come in, there'd be somebody, I don't know if it was a, a, a wolf crier or somebody who would just go, my boss. <laughs> and everyone would start looking as this song is happening, you know. <laughs> so everyone was keeping busy. And he came up and he went past the reception area, found Jack Camusa, and he told him off and told him he needed to clear the reception area of all those people who were crowding the station. So everybody went except for the guys who were sorting out LPs in the little library, Zach and I. And um, after a few days, Jack was uh, kind of, he was taking time to put us on radio. So during that time, I was kind of um, afraid of the opportunity. I started kind of feeling it was a bigger opportunity than it actually was. I'd hear Moses Nyama going in, this is more funky, the more funky movements. And I'm thinking, damn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how will I do that kind of stuff? So uh, Jack came to, to us and he says, no, um, no, Zach asked Jack, like, when are we going to, you know, get put on? And Jack started, you know, trying to throw his muscle and said, if you're playing with me, I'll put you on right now. And I'm like, oh, sh And then just, <laughs> Zach says, yes, put us on. I'll flip. <laughs> and, and that's how it happened. We were, you guys know radio terminology. I was meant to throw forward to the song, but got so nervous, I ended up back announcing it. I let, let the song pass. You know, and then by that time I gathered courage. I went on, sharpshooter limba, chilu limba, sharpshooter bongo, Radio Phoenix, only the best is good enough, 89.5, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it worked. The funny story related to that, and I'll be quick on this one, is prior to getting on radio, I was a rapper. Alan Vula and I had a song that was a hit on Radio 4 and so on. So my late grandmother, Janet Banda, was at home with my family listening to, to me on radio. Um, this is on the first broadcast. So my brother, my sister, my late mom told Amboya, Chulupa Radio. So she came in and I was playing Snaps, I Got the Power, and she was dancing, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> dancing like crazy. Then after that, I announced Chulupa, what not, what not, Phoenix FM, and here's Seal's Kiss from a Rose, and I played that. And then she asked him, Naimi, Chulupa, Naimba. Because she recognized you know, that I'm a communicator, but she didn't figure that now I'm operating in a different realm as a radio presenter. So I still dabble in music. How many people have heard in Jota? That wasn't me. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, so we still do that kind of stuff. So anyway, in terms of um, lessons from radio, one of the things that I think is pretty important, and you guys from Unza FM and everyone else who's listening, is to be relevant. What happened during the time that I was on air is there were a lot of guys who would be on with the usual radio cliches. Check your time. It's, you know, 15, 25, and, and all those, you know. So there was a lot of that kind of stuff on air. And there wasn't what, what, what you were referring to earlier on, that, that um, connection with an intellectual audience. And so to kind of provoke that, uh, but at the same time be relevant, I used to try and put some humor on air. So for example, I remember Valentine's Day, 96. I'm sounding like an old man, you know, talking about old memories. <laughs> but Valentine's Day in 96, um, I went on air, and I'd paint a scenario, then put a Valentine's Day uh, rhyme. So I painted, like, I went on air and said, okay, so this uh, guy comes home from work, it's Valentine's Day, he's tired, gets to the fridge, finds out the kids have finished the food, and he says to the family, roses are red, violets are blue. I just to figure out what put a few mbu. So, you know, yeah, the intellectual ones laughed. You guys didn't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> or I'd go on air and say stuff like, um, a drunk guy gets home, you know, and uh, he's been listening to Kenny Latimer at the bar. His wife's pretty pissed off at him. And he gets to her and says to her, never too dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> intellectual ones laughed. Oh, yeah. Intellectual and those who are old. So you have to be relevant. And, and I'm going to segue that into a, a little philosophy that I kind of think um, I've been using since, you know, for, the, for 20 years or so, which is relevation. You have to be relevant in, in whatever you do, even if it's not radio, because I know some of you aren't in radio, some of you are in business. You have to be relevant to your audience. Um, the other part of relevation is to be, um, to, to elevate. 
So you have to, with what you're doing, think of ways in which you can inspire other people. So uh, relevant, elevation. And the other part is what, what you do has to be a revelation of who you are as an individual and what you stand for. That should show. So if, even if you don't necessarily speak it out, people should just kind of you know, look, look, listen to Chi's pr presentation and think this guy's concerned uh, you know, about societal issues. You know. Uh, she's concerned with human rights issues, you know. He's concerned with good music issues, <laughs> you know, and things of that sort. So whatever you do, it, it, uh, re 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 relevation is, a, is an acronym you could uh, take into consideration. I'm not going to talk for like 10 minutes, uh, so I'm going to end off with my last little nugget, and this is being, okay, I've got two more. <laughs> Did I hear a complaint? I can make it one. Um, one thing that we don't do much is to look at what's happening around the world and, and benchmark ourselves and be world class, which I think is pretty important in, in whatever you do, be it business, be it radio, and so on. Uh, in 98, I'm doing that old man thing of talking years ago, 90, 97 actually, I was asked to be MC at Miss Zambia. Prior to me, the people who had been MC at Miss Zambia were, I won't mention their names, but um, you know, people who had been around since uh, Kenneth Kaunda had swag, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I was given the opportunity to, to watch the tapes um, of the previous events because I, I couldn't watch the previous, I hadn't attended them in Zambia because prior to 97, I was a broke brother, you know, you know, so, so I, I watched these tapes and I saw the previous Miss Zambia, these guys had these big boards, you know, with, the, with A4 pieces of paper and they'd be on some, and the finalists for, you know, it was boring, you know, and I watched this thing, then I asked if I could watch the Miss World tapes. And I saw this guy coming up, and there was excitement, there was you know enthusiasm, there was there's electricity, and so I, I thought you know this is the better route to go. So from '97, I was MC at Miss Zambia. The theme song was Men in Black. We did some routine and whatnot. '98, I was MC. It was sizzling. '99, I was you know uh, 2000, they fired me, but you know that didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I went away. But the the the, the key there is that if you want to benchmark yourself. There's no harm in benchmarking yourself with the, the best in the world. And, and um, uh, earlier on, you had word about how you can listen to stations outside. There's no excuse for being mediocre on air um, in this present day. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> invoice, invoice, you know, for. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so strive to be world class. Um, and I'll end off, and no, before I end off, and, and the other thing I've noticed, which you guys should um, applaud these guys for, we were given the opportunity in these talks to use PowerPoint. None of these guys have done that. Radio, as you were saying, is theater of the mind. We've been using words and, and, and things of that sort to paint pictures of stories that we've been sharing. I was listening to a tape by Mensa Otterbill some years ago, and he was saying that he realizes that his sermons sometimes get to audiences who won't have the opportunity to see him. It'll just be tapes. And so he you know, goes through dictionaries, finds new words, and expands his vocabulary for that particular purpose. And so I'm very shocked that you guys were, you know, none of us, maybe we're just lazy. We couldn't put together a PowerPoint. <laughs> maybe that's the real reason, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> but it's, it's a good thing. All right, so lastly, and in closing, and I'll refer, because I, world class, men's world. Yeah, no, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>